listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 109, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, today we got Stefan Sapkoviak, uh, educator, biologist, master of landscape agriculture. Uh, he's taught at McGill University um, at the University of Montreal, and uh, he's the star of the uh, well-known um, among those of you who are uh, into permaculture and sort of uh, gardening nerds. Uh, the, uh, the the documentary, The Permaculture Orchard, which I love. If you've never seen it, it's very inspiring. Stefan is a very inspiring figure. He's been on the show a number of times and we got him today here in uh, 2021. Uh, and he's here to answer to today's episode. Stefan is here to actually talk about permaculture, which is something, it's a, a, an approach to gardening I use in my garden, but I don't talk it, about it that much because I don't really have any... Um, uh, credentials behind my name other than having read some books about it and just doing it um, but I, I don't I, I tend to talk around it a little bit I, I tend to there's nothing I do that is uh, that isn't consistent with the idea of permaculture but I don't tend to tag what I'm doing to that term so uh, Stefan say hello and uh, tell everybody how things are uh, how things are going in Quebec hi Greg yes thank you uh Actually, it's been such it's beautiful days. I don't know what it's like for you. We've had today was nice about six days now where it really starts to feel like, well, not spring, but certainly late winter. Uh, yes. The sap is flowing. The birds have started to come back. It's sunny. I got a sunburn the last few days pruning the orchard. So <laughs> it, it really gives you a it's a boost. You know that the, the worst is behind. Uh, but that's that's what it is. We're you know whatever climate you're in, your winter period ends at a different time, and ours is just ending now. Well, let's get uh, let's get started here, and let's just ask the straight up question: um, What is permaculture, and what makes your orchard a permaculture orchard? Maybe talk a little bit about your setup there as well. But first, let's just define permaculture. What does that mean? Uh, I, I guess you'd have to go to the Wikipedia definition. <laughs> you know. I, my very farming type definition is really applied common sense. I find that, look, if you're doing something, you know, you look at your garden practices and you look what, what made a lot of sense. Well, look, if it made a lot of sense, I guarantee you there's a few of the permaculture principles because there's a whole bunch of principles. And I bet you hit on a few of them because it made sense, you know, how far do you place something? Where do you place it relative to other? Because permaculture is all about conscious design of your environment, uh, basically to work better, to be more productive, to create habitats, to avoid problems so that you don't have to deal with the problems. That's, it's, yeah, it, there's a lot to it, but it is, it's conscious decisions of changing your area to suit you for your needs, but at the same time caring for uh, the deer around for for whatever is can be around and so on. So I, I tend to say it's you know just it's common sense. It's a lot of it. Unfortunately, like the old saying says, common sense isn't so common anymore, and it's too bad. But people have. You know, you get away from the land, the more you separate yourself from nature, things that you just do, you know, you, you can kind of see pretty well when somebody comes from the city, they do things that you think like, did, you know, have you have you thought this through, like they'll walk into an area with animals and leave a gate open. Well, like, you know, maybe you do that when you walk into your yard but there's animals in here. You leave the gate open, they go, oh, oh, hey, it's it's time to move to the next area. Yes. Uh, so things that, I, I'm not saying that's permaculture, but the common sense aspect is people used to have it a lot more because they lived on the land and they, you know, I, I remember somebody saying, yeah, what typically a kid growing up on the farm would know by 12 is way more than what somebody knows when they're 30. Right. Because yeah, you yeah, could yeah. read a lot, but that just that farm sense, we called it, and you're, you know, just common sense. It, yeah, it's not that much. It reminds me of a, a friend of mine when I was a kid. He, they had a, 
a manure lagoon kind of a manure pit, you know, a concrete lined pit. And uh, yeah, he was able to convince kids coming from the city that, oh yeah, you know, in there, oh, that's the, that's the special pool. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Really, yeah. So the kid would jump off the concrete ledge into the manure pit, you know, like <laughs> they used to get a really good laugh out of it. And uh, anyway, that's, yeah. But it's just common sense really that uh, you can use. Actually, it's funny because we're working on a, uh, I'm doing, we're doing a master class now. They're putting together all the ideas of the permaculture orchard into a master class. And we're just finishing the introduction to permaculture. And we go through all of that uh, to, to help really people understand the principles and the, the ethics and the origin of permaculture and all of that. It's not meant to be a PDC or a permaculture design course, but it's just an introduction for you know, people who haven't been exposed. Um, yeah, it's still in its infancy. There's, most people have not even heard of permaculture. I agree. But yeah. as it goes on, I still say in that it will grow faster than organic did. Because I say permaculture right now is at the same stage as organic was around 1980. And I remember because I started university in 1980 and it was like organic. You know, you buy organic. What is organic? So it's, it was that same people didn't know what it meant. And permaculture is in that stage right now, but it will grow much quicker than people's understanding of uh, organic because, I mean, we have access to so much more right now. You can spend an evening and get a pretty good idea of, oh, oh, that, oh gee, it talks about all kinds of stuff, permaculture. You could, you could talk about water. You could talk about soils. You could talk about animals. You could talk about trees. You could talk about gardening, all with a bent to organic and uh, I think the biggest confusion is people think I'm gardening this is an up uh, uh, I'm gardening with permaculture uh, it's a permaculture garden in that it's using techniques well it's not really techniques there, there isn't a technique that you're doing that is permaculture you're using principles, you're, you're using a design that makes it that you can, that's what I've done is I said, look, I went to, do I have it here? I have it, oh yeah, I have it right here. I went to Bill Mollison's text originally, and that's yeah. the big permaculture book. Yeah. And in there, he's got a whole chapter on, uh, chapter seven, I think it was, on temperate climates. And I just, maybe I can, quickly find that um yeah here it is berry fruit and the home garden so it's the temperate climate chapter in here i really i mean that's what we're definitely in temperate climate and so uh oh here it is this is basically the inspiration for the permaculture orchard okay uh where he explains what what uh, what he called basically an orchard layout using permaculture principles, and I said, "Hey, that's what that's what I want to do," and I you know used that, and I I deferred it from what he was saying simply because he was saying you put a nitrogen fixing tree in a fruit tree and a nitrogen fixing in a fruit tree. Or your trios. Well, it was duos for him. It was duos. one, two, one, two, one, two. I thought, gee, you know, I mean, we were in the most expensive farmland. I thought, <laughs> ah, you know, that's a lot of land used for, in our case, trees that don't grow a crop. That was the thing is at that time, I didn't know of sea berry, but it most all the nitrogen fixing trees I knew of or shrubs didn't produce uh, a crop. So yeah. I thought, wow, that's a lot of land being used for something that isn't going to produce something. So. I just stretched his idea and basically just to summarize uh, how I can say permaculture is it's a conscious design. So I used his, basically his text as the inspiration. We, we tore out what was an organic, we had one of the biggest organic orchards, tore it out, replanted in a 
permaculture orchard design. And amazingly, like I, as much as now I'm on the podcast and the YouTube and the film and so on, for years, I said nothing. Like I didn't say anything because I didn't know myself if it was going to work. I kind of, right. uh, you know, I read it in this book. Yes. Like, people today, you know, think, hey, I would have loved, I had this, that's what I had. And I used it, like, I used it. I really used everything I could out of it. But I would have loved to have had this, you know, this little film, this is the French one. I didn't see where my English copy is. <laughs> but the film, hey, if I would have had that when I started, gee, that would have been a huge, a huge advantage. So to give you a quick story on it, we when we had the organic orchard and it was organic and all, but we would be devoured by tent caterpillars. You get tent yes. caterpillars. I mean, yes. it they can settle in. If you have three nests in a tree, I've often had where in June, the tree looks like it's January. I mean, there's nothing left in the tree. And if you're talking middle of summer, one, that tree won't produce because there's no leaves left on it. And it won't put up any reserves for next year because all it wants to do is just recover, survive. And so we went from that, which was very typical. It was our worst problem. Then when it was redesigned and we went through, usually it's every three or four years, the caterpillars have a big year. And I went through the first big year and it was like, yeah, I'm not seeing a huge amount of damage, but the orchard's small. And then three years later, we had another big year and again, no damage. And then I was, then I was like, okay, yeah, there's something here. I mean, we would have seen something major happening if this was still, if the caterpillars were still a problem, but now it's gotten to the point and that's getting ahead, but your, your last question about wasps, yes. you know, yes. <laughs> but it's gotten to the point where now I'm excited to see those caterpillars. Like, unless you've lived it, you can't imagine, but take your worst problem and it becomes totally a non-issue to the point where you, you know, you enjoy that prop, like what was a problem? You enjoy seeing it. So, oh, cause it's a part of a larger process that you understand. Um, and you, yeah, it's, it's just yeah. one element of an equation that, you know, is, right. is probably going to solve itself. Uh, and that's that where the design, set up. yeah, because the orchard is designed from the beginning to basically help solve uh, many of the problems, unfortunately, not all of them, but many of them, and especially the worst ones. So then what you're left with, okay, yeah, you know, so we can still, now we trap the last insects that are a problem and it's doable. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. Who would you say, like, if you were to, aside from yourself <laughs> and your great YouTube channel, uh, proponents of permaculture, you know, so you've got Bill Maltz and Dave Holmgren, but, uh, you know, for the people watching, if they're going to go uh, on a deep dive someday, uh, uh, Googling or just even on YouTube, because all these guys are on, who would you say, you know, just drop a few names that people should, uh, well, I, I really would say people kind of start, just start in your climatic zone, not zone, but your climatic ballpark. Like, are you Conditions. temperate climate? Yeah, temperate. Are you maybe, you know, south of that or north of that, depending what where you're from? Uh, certainly, you know, if you're in subtropics, yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, Jeff Lawton's really nice Lawton. channel, great information. If you're in a desert area, actually his new project, Greening the Desert, pretty startling, like amazing when you see, oh God, you go from barren, I mean, bare rock to a verdant oasis. You think, how did he do that? Yeah, you can do that. And it's really just, you design the whole system First of all, to, to not lose a drop of water. And on top of it, you gain the water that's running down in the streets and things. And so there's, there's, there's things you can do to make it change. Uh, I really like Pete Canaris has a great channel if you're down in the Southern US. It is subtropics, uh, but you know Florida, that's a great one. Uh, if, you're, if you're in, Australia, another one is Morag Gamble. She's got oh, a yes. good channel yeah. and a good gardening channel as well. 
there's actually some, uh, I like Justin Rhodes, although, you know, he, he touches on a lot of aspects. It's a more of a homesteading and vlogging, but it, it kind of, you know, choose your scale, choose your style. Cause there's honestly, there's something for everyone today. Well, I think that's where, you know, one of the reasons I started a channel is that I was watching a lot of permaculture proponents and it's, they're on such a large scale. And yeah. I thought like, what about the person just for the backyard and they don't want to have chickens and pigs and, you know, they just want to have some, you know, some, some, some groceries back there and right. they don't want to go on that scale. And there wasn't a whole lot um, of uh, permaculture gurus on that small scale. I mean, I think yeah. uh, Bill Mollison's permaculture too was more, his permaculture one's more like agriculture like right? let's right. transform agriculture or permaculture too which i've read and you can get if you people if you look if you google if you type oh, in yeah. permaculture two dot j uh, dot uh, pdf you'll find a free downloadable version of that book um, but that was more like the person with a house and some land and i mean right. it's it's but anyway the whole point is that you you don't have to you can you can pick and choose and right. you can you can scale it down. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it'd be great if you can have rabbits and all these other sorts of things. But you don't have to go on that scale. You can adapt it to a four by eight bed in your backyard. Yeah. Right. I mean, because like you said, it's a, you know, it's it's a method of understanding a growing system within a larger ecosystem. I, um, I would say try as you're saying try to get scale i'm looking climate because that's kind of the first thing you want to yes. get within your climate area the second one certainly is scale and there are people as you say people doing it from a garden scale all the way up to uh, larger properties there certainly isn't as many people needing the help for larger properties as there are really gardening uh, there's one guy james prigioni in new jersey i think i've he heard is. of that guy yeah yeah he's got a very popular gardening channel but he's got several nice videos on his food forest that he started a few years ago and that's the thing is sometimes you f think well it's not called permaculture it's called food forest well food forest embraces all of the ideas for uh, permaculture and i mean it's basically the closest you can get to a permaculture orchard uh, the only difference is it's i find a lot of it is scale and density a lot of times in your backyard, you're going to do more of a food forest because you're going to put it a little more dense than you would in a in an orchard setting. Yeah. Uh, but hey, there. Type type those words in. You know, type permaculture, and if you're looking at garden, type permaculture and garden. Uh, but try a few because, like I say, it's it, there's. We're really. I I would have loved to have been in this situation thirty years ago when we bought like. I tell people, hey, when we started, we used to mail, snail mail uh, letters, newsletters to people. Like, geez, you know, this, never mind YouTube. YouTube, it's crazy now how, uh, if, if I have something I need to do, I don't even, I have a huge library, but I don't even go to my library because no. it's so much faster to just type in, what do I need to do? I need to fix uh, irrigation valve uh, bang here it is i have 10 videos i can choose from <laughs> what is it that i you know exactly i need yes. and i try to I, I made a little video last summer on the youtube advantage because it is an advantage like if you're doing a project and you're not doing your youtube research honestly you're missing out a huge amount because yeah. you can ask the, the more you know your question and the ideally i said the key is knowing the term yeah. sometimes you might be you know it's that thingy that you turn on and off well what's that thingy if you put i need that thingy you won't find it but if you say it's a valve oh oh all of a sudden you get 25 videos suggested and i say just look at three usually if you want to do something look at three because you'll see different ways people do it different tricks they use different tools they use and you'll see there's you'll often find Hey, there's one that I could do that. I don't have these fancy tools, but I have this and I can do it with that. Absolutely. And I, I would say, you know, for people watching, you know, you, you do a search on YouTube and you, you find a video that seems to be about what you want. Don't shut it off because it's low production value. 
Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. It could be some guy with like, you know, his phone, but the guy really knows what he's talking about. But it's, he's just not a professional YouTuber right. guy, but he knows his stuff, right? So you just never know. So, you know, so, you know, whatever the thing is, if it's a cooking video or a plumbing video or whatever it is, you know, gardening video, give the guy or the gal, give him a few minutes, you know, like, you'll, you'll know, uh, you know, like maybe give him five minutes, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd say, you know, at the minimum sort of thing. You never know. Sometimes people spend a lot of time talking about their stuff and they don't get into it. Uh, even I do that sometimes. Um, but, you know, give them a chance. And, you know, just because the thing isn't slick, I mean, Stefana is a great channel. Um, I've yep. gotten slightly better at editing videos over time. I, when I look back at my videos five years ago, it's just turn the camera on and <laughs> do stuff, right? Um, but the content was still good. I was still talking about, That's you it. know, but I just didn't know how to like set it up and make it kind of, you know, a little more, more, more slick. Um, but you know, there's plenty of good material. One of my favorite cooking videos was just, I mean, it's terrible in terms of the quality. Um, but it's this woman doing some Southern cooking and it's like, you're watching the thing, you're, you're putting up with the fact that it's a poorly done video. But by the time it was over, I'm like, I got to make that. That's got to be good. Right. Um, so even though it wasn't a well done video, it was like really good teaching. Um, so you just never know with these things. Yeah. Uh, I guess the second part of that question, what is permaculture? What makes your orchard a permaculture orchard? Yeah, just uh... I mean, applying the principles, uh, one of the keys to permaculture is biodiversity, you know, don't, don't, uh, and yeah, that's one of the big one and observation. I mean, it's the first principle. Observe and understand. Gosh, it's, it really is amazing. I mean, I, I kind of, I have a bit of an unfair advantage because I was trained as a biologist. So, I mean, I, really hone the craft of observing. I know how to observe. I can see things. Although, and my wife would tell me, geez, you're really not observant. I'm not observant <laughs> for some things like around the house, not at all. <laughs> but when you put me outdoors, yeah. I see there's not much that, that usually escapes, you know, my observation, whether it's hearing it, seeing it, smelling, even tasting it, you know, that's, there's, there's all, there's six senses to observing. So, really using all that is a, is a big plus. And it's like, I didn't know, like I used his Mollison's diagram, but I had to adapt it and adjust it as time went on really based on observation. And, right. and uh, that was your second question. <laughs> observation to save you time and money okay okay well why don't we just segue right into that so what's that's the whole concept observation to save you time and money what's that all about yeah it, and that's where it it really adds up uh, i'll give you the example my my classic example is i used to paint the trunks why because everybody painted trunks to prevent sun scald and what sun scald it's basically a sunburn on the trunk of a tree and these last few nights have been perfect temperature for trees to get sun scald, which means you have above zero in the day, you have a total snow cover, so it's so really white, and then it's a clear sky and the temperature, as soon as sun goes down, you can feel it dropping, and two hours later, it's already like minus 10, then it goes to minus 15. Well, if you, and I have taken, I've thermometered a trunk of a tree, like at four o'clock in the afternoon when it's in the setting sun and it's always a southwest it's called southwest injury southwest angle of the tree that bark will reach 20 degrees like you put it you feel it and it's like wow it's really warm the backside is not 20 degrees and because it's been in the shade so when you add the temperature difference dropping the tree doesn't cool off that fast i mean wood is a good insulator so it keeps that heat for a while and then you end up with a difference in the bark temperature from the front to the back and that temperature causes a crack and sometimes it's not just a crack it's an actual the bark just separates off the trunk okay because it's so hot and on and the other side is so cold that it's like ice cracking you know when it's cold it cracks so the bark will do the same it can crack and so we used to paint, I used to paint the trunks. It was four days a year 
because I have white, to paint it white. white. Yeah, yeah, painted white, so it reflects, and then it doesn't get so hot. That was like the whole the, idea. Like the birch tree. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what I used to do. I used to paint them, and I remember going by and painting these trees. And one tree I couldn't kind of paint because there was a shrub around it, and I, uh, and I just passed it by because there was too many branches, so I didn't paint it. And then one year I just came by to paint, and I thought, huh. Look at this. I never painted this tree, and yet I never need to. And never, I don't need to. That tree never got sun scald. And I thought, huh, what would happen if I deliberately planted a shrub to the southwest of every tree? And I thought, you know what? I can go one further because that was a, a red twig dogwood, which is fine, but it's not a, a crop tree or a shrub. And so I thought, what happens if I put some of the ones we're using, whether it's current or black current or hascap or gooseberry or something like that? I wouldn't don't do gooseberry because that's the south southwest and I that tree the shrub needs a little more shade. So I tried it and we did it. And gee, it's the only trees now that get it are the ones where the shrub has died out for whatever reason and I didn't replant. So we do get a few trees had sun scald, and it's always the ones that don't have a shrub, because if they've got one. It just doesn't get it. So if I think, you know, over the years, how much time and money that one observation has saved me, huge, huge, yeah, you know, yeah. walking your property and understanding, hey, how wet is it here? Or, hey, and I always say, and I, I did a video a while ago on observe during the extremes. You think, oh, it's way too windy. Go out there. Oh, it's just too cold today go out there, like go out in the extreme periods, rain, wind, snow, sun, whatever it is, whatever is a, you know, a normal day, no, a normal day, that's not going to teach you that much. But on an extreme day, you will really learn a lot because you'll say, hey, look at that. You know, I remember walking the orchard in spring and we'd get a, a late frost. And that's when I learned that kiwis growing right on the tree wouldn't suffer that last frost even if their leaves had come out but the one just three meters away in the open if i had a kiwi growing there ding completely frosted and i was like wow i guess kiwis know they want to grow up a tree on the base of a tree so we plant all our kiwis and now our grapes at the base of our nitrogen fixing trees because that's, you know, you learn that by, by observing. And I then see. that saves you, it saves you months and years of, of crop growth. So we really could, and everybody can do it. Like you just have to be out there. Just go it, out there. Yeah, and the frosts are a good time because a lot happens because of frost. So you think, oh, it's cold this morning. Then get out there. If it's cold, <laughs> get out there and, and look and see and learn. I think I... I think so. I've got fruit bushes on the south side of my apple trees, and I'm pretty sure I put them there because of a video of yours that I watched. Uh, that idea. I mean, I didn't didn't do south. What I just just south in general, but that you know the angle is coming intensely from that uh, in the winter. Um, but it made perfect sense to me, right? Um, also, it's it's different heights, so I mean, you know, it's it's not going to block. You know, it's, they're just going to work out well. They're going to be good neighbors. And then in front of that, I got, a, a, you know, strawberries, you know, I got strawberry, blueberry, apple, right? South is that way. Uh, it just works. And I, I agree with you that uh, just this weekend, I was out in my garden. Um, you know, I brought pruners out, but I didn't actually prune in the garden. I was pruning trees that surround the garden that shade it, just looking at the shade. And, and like you said in a video we did before, if you're really itching to prune, you know, to prune something else. <laughs> so I was kind of doing some stuff like that. But also, I mean, I was outside for about three hours on Sunday and I did very little work. I did a lot of just like even the stuff in my garden that I need to prune or thinking about pruning, I didn't prune it. I just looked at it. And then I was looking at other things and looking at this, just, just looking and thinking and looking, and I remember thinking, boy, I'm not really getting much done. And then I was like, no, this, this is gardening. This is part of it. You just got to look and think and remember and plan and just remember the previous years. And 
you know, catalog your observations. And I mean, you're, you're just, a, you're a clever human trying to, trying to figure it out. Um, so yeah, it's such a big part of it. And if you do, you know, it seems like a waste of time, but I think it's money in the bank because you're going to save uh, a lot of work down the road because you're going to, you know, you're going to do things that make sense because you've, so you're going to be laying in bed later on that night and you're trying to get to sleep and you're thinking, you know, if you're like me, maybe you're thinking about, I mean, you could be thinking about something else, but maybe you're thinking about your garden and thinking about stuff you saw and, hmm, I got a good idea, you know, so yeah, I completely agree. We, we cheat, Greg, because you and I both have some gray hairs and I find that as you get older, you're, you'll, you don't look at that observation as wasted time you know what you said because certainly when i was in my 30s and 40s sitting down for do two something. hours yeah <laughs> that's like no no i can't do that you have you feel compelled like you have to do something so i would say if you have a problem with that your younger audience set a timer and just give yourself try try 15 minutes just sit there don't do any like you're doing something but don't be moving around just or you could walk around, but just observe. And like it, we have we have one whole course in the master class is that teaching you how to observe because it really, you know, people. I guess in the past, and I know that the most observational I've been has been when I used to hunt. I used to hunt a lot. Right. And that really hones that skill yes. because uh, everything matters. Like yes. everything matters. You just, you know, something. And how many times I'm sure you've had it. I think you said you used to, or you do hunt and fish. I hunt. Fish, and yeah. when you're walking, there's sometimes you're walking and you, I like that the Spider-Man, they'd say your spidey sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're walking and you just stop because you know you're being watched. Like you can tell, and people have done it in psychology, the experiment where somebody from the, you know, from the other side of the room is looking at you and looking at the back of you and you'll stop and you'll feel like somebody's, you just feel somebody's, that, that look, that gaze actually projects an energy that's strong enough that you could perceive it. And not only people perceived it, but they knew what direction it was coming from. Like you think, how, how do you know? And you'd turn around and you'd look exactly where that person was looking at you from. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> and the same happens out in nature. If you're walking and you think something's watching me. And if you stop and sometimes it's taken me 10 or 15 minutes and it's just a staring contest because they're still looking at you and you're looking where the heck is this thing? And you just know, you don't exactly, you don't know where, but finding an animal that's a master of hiding. And next thing you know, well, there's a rat that's been watching you the whole time. You know, he's sitting right there and you go, oh my God, I've, I've had it where I was walking along a trail and I stopped and it was like, something's here. I know something's here. And I just looked and looked and it happened to be not, not three feet away from me. I mean, a meter away, there was a duck sitting on her eggs right there by the trail. Oh, really? And it was so perfectly camouflaged. So I stopped and I'm looking at it and I realized there's 100, 200 people walking by this trail. That duck has been sitting there for maybe a couple of weeks and is never like it'll sit tight. So as somebody was walking by, I said, did you see this duck? They said, no, where? You're right here. So I just go like that, like from a distance, just because I didn't want to put my hand close to it. And they were looking and they're saying, where? Like right there. You see that stick? You see that branch? You see that? And they're looking. And it would take them five minutes to see it. But once you saw it, it was like, oh. Yeah. oh. And then they'd say to somebody else, do you see that duck? <laughs> and they'd like, come on, how can you not see it? <laughs> and then you'd remind them, you, you, don't worry, it's not that easy. It took you five minutes. Uh, well, anyway. I found that uh, like, I have a little, in the center of my garden, I have a little bench that I put, and I mainly put it for, for filming. Just, you know, I'll okay. say, hey, you know, it's, it's this date, and today we're going to talk, uh, start the video there, and I often end it there. 
Um, but I'll also go and sit on that bench and have a beer <laughs> and just, so, I mean, the reason I'm bringing it up is for the, the thing we're talking about right now, observing is, uh, you know, I, I would mm -hmm. recommend anyone get, get a place to sit in your garden, put it right, put it somewhere where you can see as much of the garden as possible. And, you know, whatever it's a cup of tea or a coffee in the morning or, or a beer in the afternoon, whatever, right? But sit down, and when you go out to garden, just sit down with, with something like that, tea, a coffee, beer, what, whatever you like, um, and just be quiet for 10, 15 minutes and just look. And so, well, no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get ahead of myself because I'm gonna talk about wasps too. Um, so anyway, let's get to the next thing. Um, but yeah, you know, get a chair, get a place to sit. And uh, I'm sure you've got lots of places like that. Just sit down for a second. Um, all right, so the next thing, birds as insect control. Yeah, uh, I love what Sepp said. You mentioned Sepp Holzer earlier, uh, the rebel gardener or the rebel farmer. Uh, he had a great saying. I mean, that one, when I heard it, I went, man, he, he, he hit it absolutely right on the nail. He used to say, or he says, uh, if you don't want a pig to do the work, then you inherit the work of the pig. <laughs> yes. Like if you don't want a pig to do the work, then you inherit that pig's work. And I thought that's that absolutely right. Like, you, oh, I'll, no, but I don't want to have a pig. Okay. Then what the pig absolutely loves doing, you're going to have to do that. So it's like, so now I've extended it and it's, if you don't want to have chickadees in your garden, well, you're going to inherit their job. If you don't want wasps in your garden, well, you're going to inherit their job. Even I would say as far as if you don't want this and that weed in your garden, then you inherit the job of that weed. You say, come on, no, that can't be. Well, okay, you have a garden, you have a certain weed comes up. You say, well, the only thing I should do is pull it up. Have you ever stopped to think that weed is actually trying to improve your soil? You say, well, of course it is. Or you may say, no, that's ridiculous. Well, <laughs> weeds are growing basically where they are needed. Like if you have a, a place and you're, you know, your planting is full, there's no place for that weed. There, it, it won't get established or maybe one little one here and there. So that whole thing about, uh, do you want to inherit that job? So that's why birds to me have been uh, really useful because for me, like I say, the biggest problems were caterpillars. And so I've seen now that with an abundance of birds, they do the summer, uh, the spring control. They take right. care of the caterpillars in spring and then as the youngs have fledged and now they don't always stay in the orchard, now they start to disperse. Now the wasps take over. So by having birds and later wasps, I get excellent, I mean, excellent control of any caterpillars so that I don't do it. I, I don't have to do anything. What and, would you say to people? I mean, so I've had videos. I, I had a video once I called, I don't need ducks because often people watch my videos and they'll see I've got snails and, and, and slugs and something. Everything's mulched, right? And I don't use plastic mulch. I've got, you know, just yard waste. So I've got a lot of snails and slugs. And um, so people will say, well, you need ducks. And I'm like, well, I'm not in a situation where I can have ducks, but I don't need them because every time I go to the garden, there's birds everywhere, right? I'd rather have, you know, 10 sparrows than one duck. I mean, they'll do way more work. And I've got more, I've got hundreds and hundreds of birds out there, all kinds of different birds. And they come in and they're all over the place and they're, they're getting the easy food. And uh, I'll see them turn the mulch over, move it around, and they're looking for easy meal. I mean, they'll take some, they'll take some worms, I'm sure, but the, I'm pretty sure the snails and the slugs are the easier meal than the, than the, uh, the worm, because the worm can get away. Um, and there's a lot of worms that are just in the soil as opposed to like right under the mulch where all the slugs and snails like to be. Um, so, you know, but a lot of people say the birds are eating their plants and maybe that's the case for some kinds of plants in some places. Um, but I think a lot of times people think the birds eating their plants when in fact the birds eating the thing that's eating the plant. 
Exactly. Uh. <laughs> well, that comes back to what we just talked about, the observation. Anytime you're jumping to conclusions, you know, you say, oh, well, it's this. How do you know it's that? Well, I saw it at the plant that's eaten, but did you see it eating? No, but I just, well, you know, that old assume, uh, be careful. And, and that's just, it helps to confirm your hunches and watch. And sometimes actually, uh, and people who aren't used to it, get a good flashlight and go out at night. Yes. Because you could be blaming what you see in the daytime, but hey, there's a whole other shift out there, you know? Oh, yeah. There's a night shift and it's, it's active. Let me tell you, if you've ever walked in your garden at night, it seems like there's way more action at night than in the daytime. You think, well, yeah, but the birds are, never mind the birds. There's still some birds, but there's a lot of other things going on at night. Oh, yeah. And, and so, yeah, you can't always jump to conclusions. You know, I think if, if there's one thing I'd like people to really get in the habit of is not jump to the quick fixes. I have this, I'm going to use this. Like, advertising unfortunately has been has drummed into people's reflex that oh you got this problem go ahead and do that it's not always that simple because if you do that you often can create more harm than good because now you start to unbalance the system that is there for example you know if you go in and and you let's say you bring in a duck to your yard and now the duck, because it's, I call it, there's animals that are subsidized, <laughs> meaning the duck, yes, can eat slugs, but when he goes back in his pen or whatever, he would probably get some grain. Well, the birds in the wild aren't getting that same subsidy. And so you're basically making it, allowing it to survive and live through tougher times as opposed to the wild birds, which don't get that help. So if you have a duck, it'll probably eat up all that easy food. And some of the birds that were relying on it, will all of a sudden, well, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm using that as an extreme example because yeah. sure, in a lot of cases, a duck could help, but you still need, uh, I mean, a duck needs a little bit of space. We've raised 50 ducks on the farm, it's 12 acres. And they will go around quite a bit. We've tried anywhere from 200 turkeys to 15. And we found the number that it takes to really do the whole farm completely is about 20 to 25. Right. When I try to push it beyond that and I'd go to 50 or 100 or 200, that was too many for the capacity of the area. The carrying it's, capacity. Right. 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 That's, I mean, it's a simple ecological concept, but it, it applies. It applies for domestic animals as well, unless you want to do a lot of that subsidizing, which is feed them artificially. Well, yeah. And I use a similar concept. I mean, I, I've got a sponsor for the show and they, they produce, you know, organically acceptable pesticides, savers. And, um, but and I'll, and I'll use some of their products in my garden, but I'll, you know, the videos I've done about it, I say, I use these things. So could I cover my entire garden with slug and snail killer and just eliminate the slugs and snails and not have a slug and snail problem? Probably if I reapplied it every two weeks all summer long, um, but I don't want to do that. I, I want them there. Like, you know, I'll use them in very, um, specific you know like if i'm planting a, a squash plant when it's putting on its first two leaves it's unbelievably vulnerable to slug so i'll put a few little bits of slug bait out there this one just breaks down to iron basically um just to protect it until it puts out the next leaf once it puts out the next leaves it's spiny and it's it's slug proof and then i've got slugs everywhere and snails everywhere and it doesn't matter and they're actually breaking down uh, all the organic matter on my so they're actually doing the work of worms and they're, they're helping to fertilize my garden. And they're not only that, but because they're there, they're every single thing that eats slugs in the area is saying, hey, this is a great place. There's slugs everywhere. So over time, because I've had, I have found, I mean, I, I started gardening here in 2014, 2015. Um, 
and the, the slug and I need like less and less and less and less work to manage them over time. Um, just the, the most minimal application to just get my plants established. Once they're established, I don't do anything anymore. And I notice also if I space them out a bit more. So if I had kale plants, if they're really close together and there's a lot of fo uh, foliage overlapping, I have more slugs. If the plants are spaced out and there's more, more sunlight stuff coming through, it's easier for the birds to get in there. It's harder for them to, to, to hide. I mean, I'm not exactly sure if that's what the case is, but I know if I space them out, I get less slug and snail damage. I'm, I'm guessing it's because there's just, they're more scared because they're, they're, they're averse to light, but it's also just easier for the things that come in to kill them. I'm helping the things that hunt them, hunt them. Just like if you were, I use the example of hunting deer. If you've got a thick, thick forest where you can't see, you're not going to get any deer. If it's a nice open forest with, you know, 50 yard sight lines, uh, that's a better place to hunt, right? So I'm just making it a better hunting ground for the things I want hunting in my garden. So I, I always say your goal with any sort of, whatever method you're using to control your pests, your goal is not to wipe the pest out. Um, right. I mean, your goal is, to, you know, protect the plant to, to whatever extent you need to, but just like you're saying, you don't want to do the work of the bird. Right, so mm -hmm. if, if you have to do something, do something, but uh, don't take the bird out of the equation. You know, give the bird a reason to be around. I would bet too that from the first years when you came to now, you have now built up a lot of your predator populations oh, yeah. that are critical. Like slugs, one of the most important, there's a black ground beetle that especially lives in mulch. And if you move mulch around, and it's only out at night, if you move the mulch around, it hunts when basically snails are moving around. I mean, that thing is voracious against. Really? Yeah, it's, it's in our zone? big. It's, yeah, it's about a one inch, it's a big ground beetle. And that's when, that's its favorite prey is uh, slugs. And, you know, I, but it's- Is it that takes... those big ones? Like there's, there's a, you know, like there's only so many big black beetles you see out in the, in the garden. That, Most that really... likely. Yeah. It's like the size of like, you know, a thumb, sort of, of, yeah. yeah, a tip of a finger. Yeah. Sort of right. thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. There. And I mean, it takes a pretty big insect to eat a, a slug. I mean, they can be pretty big and that's, that's what they do. And you don't see them in the daytime unless you're moving mulch and then you'll find it hidden. They especially like an easy way to create habitat for them is to put a few sh smallish pieces of board, you know, a foot long and just put them in several places. And if you lift that in the daytime slowly, you'll see them sleeping right underneath that because it's insulating because a board is fairly thick. So it doesn't get as hot under the board. Right. And uh, yeah, that'll be just what they need. And then they'll come out and they have an effective radius of about, uh, what is it? Radius is one direction, diameter is both. Yeah, That's a right. radius <laughs> of about 10 feet. So, you know, three to four meters, it doesn't travel that far. But wow. think of it, this thing is, you know, it's that big. If it does that in the night to come back to its hiding place, so in a circle around, but it takes a while because these predators don't multiply like, you know, like slugs would or something else. No, they, the predator is always, I mean, it's an apex predator. So it's the right? last last thing to the party. Um, you it. know, the, the, the herbivores show up and they multiply and they multiply and then something comes in eventually and starts doing some damage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why you're, especially if you're just setting up, uh, maybe you can talk about this a little bit. There's, there's, I, I remember reading this, I just can't remember the reference when you're setting up one of these, uh, no uh, permaculture garden, no-till garden, but basically a garden that's covered in mulch, right? They'll say your first year will be amazing. Your second year is a disaster, uh, because you know, all of your pests show up because right. you've just given them the most incredible place ever and you've got no predators in that second year. Is that a thing you've yeah. experienced? Yeah, because I mean, that's a, a, a basic in ecology. It's a prey have a, they call it an R scale or an R. Um, it increases like exponentially. The prey will, the pest basically is always prey. They increase like just boom, they're up there. And the predator always, it, it increases slowly and it takes a while. So that's why your second year, your prey has hit peak, but your predator still, the population still climbing and it takes a few years and you're, you know, five, six, seven years, your prey now, 
are being controlled by your pop predators, which have established a good population. And that's yeah, yeah. where, as you say, you know, be careful, be judicious. Don't overuse things just because they work. Use them where you need them. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, we trap insects, but we're being very specific the same. Target what actually can be damaged. If a tree has no fruit or has five fruit, let them get those five fruit. I don't care. But a tree that's loaded, I want that one protected better. So it, it's that same strategy. Well, since we're on that topic, let's talk about wasps. Why should we love wasps? I love wasps. I mean, it's crazy <laughs> to think, but they are the number one, you talked about it, apex predator. They're the top of the insect food chain. Like they're the wolves in, you know, in Canada or the bob, or not bobcats, bobcats, not the top predator, the mountain lion, you know, they're, they're actually more like wolves because they are, uh, they form basically hives where there's many. Some of them are solitary. You get big, like mud wasps are solitary and they catch uh, a wasp. What I like about them the most is the bigger the wasp, the bigger the prey. And usually if you see it, and I've watched many a times a wasp taking off with a caterpillar, yes. it will be the length of the wasp. Like they're, they're looking for one that, they're not looking for the little one. If it's a big wasp, they, I've never seen them take a little caterpillar. They're looking for the one that's their length. And that's, I mean, you think of it, this thing is carrying something half its weight and it's carrying it back to the nest. Flying. So, <laughs> it's flying. flying. Yeah, with the <laughs> like load. A, like a Sikorsky helicopter. <laughs> right, yeah. So I always, yeah. I always look and you can see if it's got prey just by the way it's flying. because. A, an empty wasp will just dart off straight and just go. But one that has a load, he can't even dart because he's not ra rising fast enough. So he usually does a few circles just to get some altitude uh. to fly above the shrubs or the trees to go to the nest. So it's, <laughs> it's like, what? Why isn't it just, well, because it can't. It's just loaded down so much. So really, uh, I know a lot of people give wasps a bad rap and i've been stung by them it's not like you know and the thing with wasps is you got to understand that they never voluntarily want to sting you they just they don't a sting is a huge waste of energy like that takes them a lot of energy to inject that venom and to produce more venom so what they're looking to do is they just want to protect their runway and i've done this uh, I have a video on wasps, why I love wasps. And it really shows people that if you have, and I mean, the, the nest that I was next to is, it's, it's a big nest. It's like just about basketball size. And I can be, you know, not even an arm's length away from it and right near it and watching it. But I've learned then through observation that as long as, and you watch them, just watch, they always have the same flight path. They all, if they're coming this way, then they're all coming this way. There's not one coming here and one over there. They all, this is their flight path and it's like a runway. And I say to people, you know, look at, imagine the analogy, you go to your local airport and you start driving around on the runway. They're gonna come and get you pretty quick. Not yeah. as fast as wasps. I mean, wasps, you've got about three seconds. <laughs> if you stand right in, like if this is the runway, and you can stand off to the side and watch it and it's okay. But if you go, oh, look at them coming in. If you're in the runway, there's always wasps on the outside of the hole will come and attack you and just to move you out of the way because that's what their job is. Keep that runway clear because think of it, you know, that, that heavily loaded one with a, it's not very maneuverable. Mm. Like don't ask it to zip around something. It can't, it's, it's so loaded. And by the time it's coming, it's probably pretty exhausted, honestly. So the others, their job is just keep that, that space clear. So it's mostly uh, wasps, it's mostly caterpillars, but then there's a whole group of wasps that are parasitic. And the same idea, they now uh, drop an egg onto a caterpillar. They don't, they can't carry the caterpillar and they can put eggs on big uh, caterpillars, 
And so they'll lay an egg and the egg will actually eat that caterpillar from the inside out. And then the adult will emerge out of the caterpillar when it's ready. Uh, but oh, that's, we, I call those mummified ones. So when that's we terrifying. see caterpillars, yeah, well, the horror stories, you know, I'm sure you've seen horror movies and so on. That's, they're just going, you know, what looks gruesome? Well, that happens in nature all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like saw, caterpillars. I saw, so I think I was watching one of your videos talking about this. And at that same time, it was the summer and it's the time of year that my brassicas, you know, broccoli, kale, start getting a um, uh, problem with the, uh, what's it called? The white fly. Cabbage, cabbage the, moth. The small white. Or oh, whatever, the white little, fly. Little okay. white butterfly that, yeah. you know, puts a cat perfectly camouflaged caterpillar on. And uh, so, I mean, my first couple of years, I didn't have any problems. Then one year, my, my plants were just like year two or year three, they were just destroyed by these things. And then I started using uh, BTK, right? So I'd put, you know, which is a bacteria. So I'd put it just two applications would all, all, you know, I'd put it on one evening, two weeks later, put it on again. And it wouldn't, you know, 100% eliminate them. But again, I was going with that idea. I don't want to get rid of these things because I want to bring in the things that, that attack them. So every year I do that. And I think the year previous to last year, I just did one application and it seemed to like just do an application to see what happens, right? So the previous year, 2019, I did one application and it seemed to be enough to get it under control. Now, last year I was sitting on my little bench having a beer or something like that. And something went by my ear. I saw a wasp go to a broccoli. I saw it land on the broccoli, look around a little bit. And I, just like you're saying, when it got up, it, it didn't fly away, it, you know, and then it, I could see it had something, right? I said, no way, that can't be that thing he was saying. And then I, I watched another wasp came along, you know, and because people will say with these things, pick them off your plants. And I'm like, who in the hell has the, the dexterity, the visual acuity, the time, to find those caterpillars, especially when they're juvenile. I mean, people say it, but you know, I'm pretty in tune with things, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very, you know, if, if it was something that that was feasible to do, I would do it. Um, but I don't see how, especially if you, I've got like, you know, 30 kale plants, you know, uh, a dozen broccoli, a dozen, you know, I got a lot of different brassicas, right? How on earth am I going to manage all of that, picking them off? Um, well, there's something that's really good at it. I mean, it's, it's the same size. They're, they're, they're like, you know, uh, evolved to hunt and find them. They can probably see, smell, and hear them. Whereas for me, I'd have to just see it. I've got one sense working for me and I can't, you know, I just, I'm not geared for it. I can't get in there and look around. So over and over again, I'm, I'm noticing that I went over and stood right next to the plant and was watching and I saw one land and they were getting the sort of smaller juvenile ones, right? And flying away from them. And I thought, ah, it's finally happened. They're solving the problem for me. I don't need to do anything. And last year I didn't use any BTK. I didn't need to use anything on that plant. Um, so, you know, I've got, I don't know what kind of wasp that was. I should have gotten more footage of it. Um, but the problem was just solved for me by these wasps. So well, think of it, you have a nest somewhere, right? I'm aware. And What's easier than finding, and in, in ecology, we used to always, always call it foraging by patches, because that's what it is. Food isn't distributed evenly everywhere. It's just not. Like you'll have a, one of your kale plants has five times more caterpillars than all the others. Right. Well, once the wasp has spent the time going over the 30 kale plants and found the one uh. this one has. So... I suspect, I mean, did nobody, I don't know if anybody's actually studied this, but I suspect one of the reasons too that they circle is they make a mental map or, or mental note of where that kale plant was. Because bees good do place. that. Honeybees do that too. When uh, they orient by, they'll circle, they do waggle dance and so on, but they'll, they'll kind of, oh, okay, this is where, and then they, then they can relay that information. So for a wasp, if it finds a kale plant in your garden that's got, you know, 
40 of these caterpillars. Well, why should it go looking all over? It found that patch. It's just going to keep coming back until it empties. And that's what I've seen with birds. I mean, the best is chickadees. Man, if they find a tree where there's a nest of these 10 caterpillars, within two days, I can't find a caterpillar in this tree. There might be one or two escaped somewhere, but they've cleaned it absolutely. But for two days, they're happy because think of it, you know, these parents, they've got to feed these young and the young never stop car, you know, calling for food. So once they find a patch that like, wow, we got 200 caterpillars in here. Those chickadees, they look at each other, they go, honey, we got two days off. What are we going to do for two days? Because it's super easy. They just go to the thing, pick up one, two, bring it, feed, come back. And they do this five times. All the chicks are full for 10 minutes. And now they can go take a, a dust bath or go for a drink or <laughs> yeah, kick back and watch uh, Netflix for uh, now. <laughs> the chickadee version of yeah. Netflix. Was it, would you say the chickadee is the, the number one tent caterpillar? Uh... Uh, predator or, and where, as no, birds are, where birds are it's, concerned? It's actually better on some of the other caterpillars, uh, right. especially the little green ones there, like the like the ones you're talking about in the kale. That's really they really like those. Tough to see. Like I don't see where they're finding them, but they're finding them. Uh, right. Yeah. They're... Just show up and start, you said. Well, yeah, that's the last thing. So just show up and start. You did a video about that. Um, right. So I thought I like that. I find that I thought it'd be a good one to end on because uh, it's it's kind of inspiring. Um, so why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I was lucky. I had a high school teacher um, in geography that used to say that. He said, hey, OK, you got time to do this exercise now. Just start, he said, and he used to reemphasize, you know, starting is having 50% of the job done. And as the years have gone by, I realized the, the logic of that. Because if you start now, even though you only do 10%, but you've started, it's so much easier to come back and finish it than if you say, okay, I'll start it tomorrow, I'll, uh, next week. Uh, yeah, uh, next thing you know, it's next season. Oh, it's not the right season anymore. Next year. And let me tell you, I'm an expert at it. If you put off for three or four years, all of a sudden, it's like, geez, you know, do I, you know, should I do that? Is it going to, or is it too late and it doesn't matter anymore? So, especially for the young people, I would say, get on that. And, and a lot of times it's just start. I say to people, just start with two trios. You want to put in a permaculture orchard? It sounds great. You know, hundreds of trees. Great. I say, just start with two trios because that's something you can do in a weekend or even a day. It's a bite size quantity of work. And actually you will learn as much from two trios as you would if you had a hundred or 200 or 300 trees. Because right. you already have the, the cycles will start. You'll see the, the whole process. And that learning is, is really, really important. And you say, well, you know, I don't have my property yet. Or, and we can always make excuses for why. Why can't you start? Well, you know, uh, uh, there's always a reason. But when you want to do something, and I did a, a, a little video of this uh, last fall, about when you have an idea. With each idea, it's like a seed. You have in that idea, the, the energy, the germ, if you like, is, is one part and the starchy energy store is another. So that seed has an energy store. And if you don't put it in the ground and plant it, mm. eventually that energy store will, will shrink and, will, and then your seed is no longer viable. So the same for an idea, you have a project, you know, I, this year I want to plant kale. So what can you do? Oh, just start. Yeah. You know, just, you don't even have the, you say, oh, I don't have the catalog. Somebody would say, Hey, I don't have the catalog. Look them up online, oh, yeah. order it online. In fact, if you don't this year, I guarantee you, if you don't get your order in, I would say before end of April, forget it. 
I mean, I, I talked to Lawrence as uh, the guy from Wiffletree. I said, Lawrence, how did last year? Oh, he said it was it was crazy. He said, we ran out of a whole bunch of stuff. And I said, well, if you had all the stock, he said, we would have sold at least 50% more. Like wow. we could have sold 50% more of stuff. He just didn't have enough. So this year is going to be, I, I predict it'll even be worse because people will say, oh, last year I wanted to do it, but this year I'm going to do it. And then they're going to come to do it. And it, sorry, it's sold out. So if you see a seed packet with kale and you don't say, oh, it's not the red Russian, just get it, get something because get something. it may not be there when you do want to do it. So oh, that, and, and, yeah, that oh, starting and, is so important. Well, and to your point, like it, you don't need the, the physical catalog because I actually, I, I, they send these to me. I never use them. I, I do everything online because you can go in the catalog whoever you're going to buy your seed from look at the different varieties and then whatever the variety is you're you're contemplating buying you can go look it up online and get you know three four or five read about it from three or four or five different sources right i mean the catalog is going to have some sort of write-up about it and they're going to say it's great but you know you're going to you know i always tend to go look okay what are they not telling me about this right so they do a little bit you, if you're online you can do that you can look and you might even watch a video of someone you can actually see someone growing them so you can get a better idea in your head a better plan for what you're going to do uh, but um, I, I would say though be careful eh? like this this cat i didn't have the catalog i i think i just went online they have a great website too but be careful because they made it so easy you just Hey, that that's interesting. You just click it. Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. <laughs> I, I was at fifteen hundred, and all of a sudden I said, "I think I'll check out." And I went, "What? Like, what happened?" Yeah, yes. it it can add up really quickly because trees. It's not like a seed packet at you know two dollars or three dollars for a seed packet. A tree can be fifty bucks, so it, it can go up pretty fast. What would you say to someone? Mom? You know, this is something I've been thinking about because I, I spend a lot of time in the woods. And I think there's something to be said if you're thinking about gardening to go spend time in the woods because you can look at, like there's a con, I don't know if you have a video about this or not. I seem to feel like you do. Um, in permaculture, they talk about like edges, right? Transitions, right? Um, and if you're in a forest, you can see, like if you've got, uh, let's say a tree line. So a tree line's where a part of a natural system is not trees and where it meets the trees. Sometimes there's natural fields or you know, where I live, it tends to be bushes. There's certain mm -hmm. kinds of, I'm guessing it's soil, certain kinds of soil just will not support trees. So it'll all be sort of like knee waist high bushes and then you'll have trees and you'll see where the, where the bushes meet the trees. There's things growing right there that don't grow anywhere else. And if the bushes meet the trees and it's south facing, you'll tend to get your fruit there. Uh, if the bushes meet the trees and it's like north facing, you get different things growing there, right? right. Um, so just spending time in that natural system, you can get a lot. Let's say you're a person living in an apartment and you don't own a house, you're planning to and you want to, um, you can still garden in the sense that you can get your head wrapped around the idea of gardening by just going into these natural systems and look at how plants respond to those different conditions. And you can, you can start getting an idea in your head of how to design your garden just by looking at how a garden that just sort of happened, happened because certain things are going to grow here, certain things, oh, there's a rock here. What's growing on the left side of the rock? What's growing on the rock? Why is that the case? And why is there things growing next to the rock that don't grow anywhere else? Oh, the rock holds heat, right? And the, the rock has a north side and a south side and the east side and a west. You can just, you can, you know, so read about permaculture, you know, binge watch Stefan's videos, but go out and just look at places like, I mean, you can go to a guard, but if you want to learn about permaculture, go out in a natural system yeah. um, because it's, you know, even if you're just going for a walk, look at the ditch on the side of the road. Notice yeah. at the bottom of the ditch where it's wet and up higher where it's drier. It's like a little mountain with a valley and you can learn a lot just by looking at those little things. Right. So yeah. um, to me, that's, that's sort of like studying, right. It's, it's studying. I used to so, say, uh, I used to do a lot of uh, consulting 
And one of my favorite tricks was uh, I would just look for plants that are analogs. For example, you go somewhere, you look at a property, and okay, it's a field, it's maybe hay or it's a tilled field. That's not the example. What I'm looking for is the edge. And if there isn't any edge, then I look for a ditch. Because a ditch will already tell you a whole lot that, that you will learn. And so along these edges, I'm just looking for what plants are growing naturally. Yes. And then in your area, what would, what would be naturally growing? You were saying blueberry. I guess you would have blueberries in some Blackberry, blueberry, we have Queen Anne's lace, you know, it's sort of, so Queen Anne's lace, okay. I know parsnips grow really well where I am. And what do you know? There's Queen Anne's lace all over the damn place, right? Yeah. Um, so we have wild strawberries everywhere. And strawberries grow really well, right? Uh, so, you know, dandelions grow really well. So dandelion-like things grow really well, you know, so. That's um, it. Looking, yeah, looking what's, what exactly, and is there a, exactly that, what is a similar plant? If it's wild, strawberry is a good one. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a quick way to observe and learn. But I just wanted to make a point while you're talking about finding a natural area and we're talking about just start. Don't be uh, discouraged by thinking, well, we don't really have an, a natural area. A lot of areas, especially in urban and suburban are disturbed areas, but the lessons are there. As long as it's not a manicured area where, you yes. know, let's say mowing, mowing destroys the succession. For example, you can, you know, nothing's naturally happening and not much. But if there is an edge of that, or if there's, you know, some part of it that isn't mowed actively, then you've got that interaction and you got that change and you got the plants happening that are giving you lessons. Your rock example is perfect, you know, just sitting down and looking and, and what you said is, I think the most important for observation is asking why. If you learn to question, you know, why, why am I getting these um, cabbage moth butterflies on kale? You know, why is this growing by the rock here and not somewhere else? Those are really, you know, once you've asked the right question and you're open, you will, your observation will point out things that are happening you know your your example of seeing the wasps dinging the the caterpillars you know there it is <laughs> oh, you're in the right place. yeah yeah no that's that was that moment where i said hey is this the situation it's it's arrived like the, i finally you know i've got some kind of balance here you know like i've got birds showing up i got i got garter snakes i got toads i got frogs i got wasps it's all working out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hopefully, we'll, we'll see how this year goes, but uh, yep. it seems to be getting better. Everyone, if you enjoy the show and you like having, uh, you know, the guests like Stefan uh, and you want to help support the show, uh, just check out my sponsors, Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. If you go to Vessi Seeds, you can use my coupon code GAVS21. And uh, the details are in the description box if you're on uh, YouTube, if you're on my website, just check out the show notes. You can get uh, free shipping from Vessi Seeds. Uh, if you wanna use products from uh, Safer's Gardening Products, you can buy them pretty much any, any major department store, hardware store, whatever. But you can also buy their stuff from Vessi Seeds. And the, I, don't, I mean, they, have, they even have traps. Like Stefan was talking about traps for certain kinds of pests. Safer's has these sort of sticky traps, right? I think that's what you were referring yep. to. Um, it's, it's sort of like a yellow, red, bullseye-ish type thing that um, the certain kinds of pests are drawn to. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the few things I use, they sell at Vessi Seeds. So yeah, if you, if you want to help support the show, don't give me money. Just if, you, if they sell something you need, buy it from them. Use my coupon code. That's all you got to do to help support this show. Um, but that's, uh, that's about it for this week. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for coming on the show and answering our questions about uh, permaculture is great having you always <laughs> and thank um, you greg yep. <laughs> everybody until next time get out there get at it have fun in your garden i hope you have a great year 